And just so we can see these stack frames, I definitely think it's important that if you see some snippet of assembly like this, this you can manually walk through and create and destroy the stack frames by yourself. So uh, I'm just going to show this quick. Over to the board. Now this is a very simple example. It doesn't have local variables, for instance. So these stack frames are going to be quite simple. But we start out at main at address 401010. So that's where we're assuming this is the first address that it executes. The first instruction that executes, it does a push EVP. And so we wrote this always as saved EVP. Right? So wherever EVP was when we got into this code, it takes that register and saves it on the stack. And when you save that on a stack, your, your uh, stack pointer was wherever it was up here. But we know at this point, when that gets put on there, uh, ESP points right here right now. Right? You push something on the stack, EV, ESP is always pointing at whatever's on the top of the stack. So, and a refresher for people who didn't have this, uh, I write my stack frames like this is the uh, bottom, but this is uh, high addresses. And this is the top, and this is low adders, right? So I said stack grows towards low addresses, so our stack frame is going to grow this way. Other people write their stack frames vertical, growing up. Other people write them horizontal, going left or right, whatever. Push EVP. Next instruction, move ESP. Remember, we're moving from right to left. Move whatever's in ESP into EVP. So right now, ESP points here. We want to change the EVP register so that it now EVP has the same value in it as ESP. So they're now both pointing at the same place. They're both pointing at the same EVP. Next, we immediately move into calling a subroutine. Now we said the side effect of the call instruction is that it pushes the address of the next instruction after the call onto the stack. So the next instruction after the call is 401018, right? So that's going to get pushed onto the stack. So we're going to go 401018. That gets pushed onto the stack. When it gets pushed onto the stack, ESP is consequently updated. ESP now points there. And we have transferred to the code at sub, or subroutine, not subtract. All right, first thing it does is it issues our standard stack frame setup, push EVP, move ESP to EVP. All right, so whatever this was, we're just going to make up some number for it. We're having some concrete values. We're going to say it was 12 FFD0 or something like that. Uh, it's going to take whatever was in EVP, and sorry, this is the address of that in memory, this location of stack in memory. It's going to take that, it's going to save that. So this is uh, the new saved EVP. And it's specifically 12 FFD0. And this is some you know, real number as well. It's whatever was way up there. We don't know what that is out of our stack frame. We do that. And then I'm just going to say we right away move the uh, ESP to EVP. So ESP was pointing here when we did it. We're going to move EVP there as well. So when we pushed it, this pointed there. And when we did the next instruction, move ESP to EVP, that now points there. So now we're pointing here and we said like these are always kind of like linked lists because EVP points at this one, this one points back at this one, this one points at that one up there. And so that's how you, that's when debuggers do commands like, you know, print stack trace, print to show you what function you're currently in. They're walking this list and then they're looking at this instruction pointer that they assume is going to be immediately before the stack frame and they're saying, which function is that from? And then they say, you know, you were in main right here. All right, so the only thing we just did is the subs uh, move ESP to EVP, and then the only thing it does is move hex B to EAX. All right, anyone remember why it's moving it to EAX based on that C code? Yes? Yep, per convention on x86, EAX is the register used to store your return values. So in the C code, we see we're doing return hex B. And so in the assembly code, we move hex beef to EAX so that when we return, if the function above us, the function that called us wants to check the return value, it knows to always check EAX. 
All right, so we did that, whatever. That has no effect on our stack. Now we get to the next instruction, pop EVP. That's, we're starting to tear down the stack. We're doing pop EVP in return. All right, so the first thing, pop EVP says, take whatever's on the top of the stack. ESP is currently pointing here. Take that and copy that value into EVP. All right, so we're popping it off the stack. So ESP is getting updated to point, sorry, updated to point here. And then EVP just got its value overwritten with whatever was on the stack, which happens to be 12 FFP0. So EVP now points there. And then finally, we issue the return instruction. Right? That says whatever ESP is pointing to currently. I'm going to take that off the stack and put that into EIP. Right? We said EIP, you can't just like manually do a move instruction on. The only way to change EIP is to do calls, returns, jumps, that sort of thing. All right, so pop, or return rather. Return takes whatever's in ESP, which is right there, pops it off of the stack. So for a pop, ESP gets updated. And then, you know, that gets set into EIP. So that was 401018. We're now back to, uh, over to the slides. Bill over, he's doing other classes as well. So I shouldn't do that so much. Right, so when we do this return instruction, it takes whatever's on the top of stack, which was this specific address, and it sets EIP to that. So we know immediately after that return instruction, we're going to be at this move hex move to EAX. All right, back over to the slides. Wait, hold on, did uh, Mike have something? That was the previous question. All right, so finally, we're back in main. We move hex move to EAX, showing the pointlessness of moving hex beef there. And then finally, we're tearing down this stack frame as well. And we're doing, so in, I guess in other things, I, I called this like uh, address of guy who called main or something like that. Address of instruction after all main. That was also on the stack at the time that we got into this thing, before we even pushed EVP, right? So we're at the pop EVP, so we take this right here, pop that off the stack. So ESP now points there. EVP points up here, wherever the previous stack frame was. And then finally, return says whatever ESP is pointing to, pop that off the stack, and then go back to that address. And we said that address is the address of whatever code called main, because typically on Linux or Windows, <coughs> there's going to be some C runtime initialization or something that occurs before you actually do the call to main. So in reality, when you start the thing up, it, uh, you know, it starts uh, initializing your libraries. And then when everything is set up, it goes you know, call main. And so obviously, you can return from main back to that. All right. Any questions on that? Any questions on the setup or teardown of the stack? All right. On we go, one hour in, into the real stuff. <clears throat> this is what you're going to learn. I'm pretty sure on this picture, uh, we cover everything except this XCR0, which I don't know what that is even. And, uh, no, no, no. yep. I'm pretty sure we cover everything except that one thing. So by the end of this, you'll know that. Isn't that nice? Madness. <clears throat> Pause for effect. Can someone please say this is madness? Yeah. This is madness. <laughs> this is x No, intermediate x <laughs> All right. And as a nerd, you shouldn't uh, accept this ridiculousness because definitely didn't say it at this point, right? That's obviously during the end of the battle, but the messenger actually said it much earlier. But I couldn't find any picture, pictures of him shouting at the messenger that were big and high quality and stuff. So that was a Google Images fail. And also, I'm lazy and I didn't want to go ahead and get a screenshot from the thing. All right, so this is actually supposed to be your morning warm up. This is, uh, this is just going to introduce you to a new instruction which uh, has some utility. <coughs> so, I hope someday, you know, these classes actually, you know, get used by other people and then they have like a remix video of me like shouting. This is All right. 
So CPU ID is uh, CPU feature identification. So this is an instruction which tells you um, what features your CPU currently uh, supports. Because as time you know, goes on, they keep adding more features. And so if you want your code to be, um, you need your code to not just assume that something's going to be there. right? So when you have code which is meant to run across many things and be backwards compatible, et cetera, you need to check before you uh, try to use some features like hyper-threading or whether you even know you can go, whether it's 64-bit or anything like that. Especially hardware virtualization, right? It should be a quick and it should be a quick and easy check if you write a hypervisor to uh, not try to start your hypervisor using the hardware support for virtualization. If you just check and see it's not there, then you got to either use software-based virtualization or whatever. All right. <clears throat> so CPU CPU ID instruction doesn't have operands like some other things like add and move, etc. In that sense, it doesn't have operands in the sense that when you uh, actually call the instruction, you'll see any operands to it. It implicitly is always taking whatever's in EAX and doing something based on that. So you set up EAX before you issue CPU ID, and then uh, based on whatever's in EAX, it's going to look up different information for you. And when it looks up that information, then it spits it out to EAX, EBX, ECX, EDX. So assume that before you issue CPU ID, you need to set EAX, and after you issue CPU ID, assume that a, B, C, D are all going to be overwritten new information. <clears throat> all right, and so there is a minor um, thing here which, you know, ostensibly we, you shouldn't really ever have to worry about, but in reality, just to be, um, let's say you're running some software that you're going to run on early model 486s, you need to know whether you can even issue the CPU ID instruction. So it turns out that uh, Intel added the ID flag to the E flags register. And so you need to be able, so if your program can set or clear the ID flag, whatever the ID flag is right now, you need to be able to either, if it's zero, you got to set it to one and then go and check, did it actually get set to one? If so, I can use CPU ID. If it's set to zero, you set it to one, you wrote it back and it's still set to zero, that means you may not use CPU ID. Same thing with one, is it order? <clears throat> so then this adds in the question of how do we actually read and write E flags, right? So you have to actually set it. So previously we only heard of E flags in the context of you do an add and if the result is zero, the zero flag gets set, right? All the arithmetic flags are in there, but um, or comparison flags or whatever you want, conditional code flags, we'll say. All of those are in there, but uh, there's a whole bunch of other stuff in there as well. So uh, for that we need the push FD and pop FD instructions. So push FD is uh, pushing the flags onto the stack, and specifically, uh, we're using the D prefix here because uh, to specify we want to push the D flags, or sorry, D word size D flags onto the stack because, like EAX and EBX and ECX, there used to be a 16-bit version in back when Intel was only 16-bit called flags rather than E flags. That was 16 bits. <coughs> Turns out. Although these all have the same opcodes, and we had talked a little bit in the last class about uh, how you deal with ambiguity. Sorry, people on the thing, I was just pointing at all those uh, C, nine Cs. Although these all have the same opcodes, um, Visual Studio will always force, if you type push F, if you type push F in some inline assembly, Visual Studio will always force a prefix on this opcode, which forces this to be the 16-bit version. So you'll get 16 bits rather than 32 bits. So by using the push FD, it's telling the assembler, hey, I really want this 32-bit you know, form, and then we'll give it to you. <coughs> so hey, Gino? Yes, question. Go ahead. Is all this information then just stored in microcode within the processor? The information returned by CPU ID or the E-flags information? The uh, CPU ID information. That's a good question. I don't know whether it's stored in microcode, but that would sort of make sense. But I would call it micro data. I don't know. I don't know to the extent that uh, that sort of thing is stored as data, whether you consider that microcode or not. Unfortunately, I don't know enough about microcode to say <coughs> one way or the other on that. <coughs> it's certainly stored within the CPU, obviously, but where and how, I'm not sure. 
Good question, though. Should look into that. Yeah, and I always like questions where I don't know the answer, so I can go look into them later. So where is the CPU ID stuff stored? <clears throat> All right. All right. So on uh, so push just takes your 32-bit push up the takes your 32-bit D flags register, pushes it onto the stack just like anything else. Op FD, same thing. It just says whatever's pointed to by ESP right now, take that, read it off the stack, stick it into the uh, E flags register. There are a couple of flags that you actually can't set, which I think we'll get to late in the class. There's some flags which, for security purposes, you don't want ring zero or ring three code being able to set. So later on, when we get to that, we'll talk about it. But most of the flags can be set just by pushing and popping. Yes. So given the, the, the difference between pop F and pop FD, appears to be whether you get the upper X. Which which one do you want to be set with? The ID flag. Um. Yeah. I should have put that into the uh, into the slides. I keep like always thinking to put the CPU ID uh, or the E flags into the slides, but you know. You're old enough now that you can handle the manual, so I will show you where the... Uh, so in the previous class we said we only want you to think about there being a couple of uh, E flags and everything else, I don't care. But let's find the E flags, shall we? Alright, U dash flag. So this is the E flags register. Where is it? One. Yep, there it is. All right. So, <coughs> yeah. So yeah, all that stuff that we talked about before: carry flag, parity flag, auxiliary flag, zero flag, sign flag. Those are all your typical flags which get set. Uh, those bottom, you know, eight bits. Those are plus some reserved ones. Bottom eight bits, only like five flags. Those are set for all your arithmetic operations, and you know, <clears throat> in some other special cases as well. Trap flag we're going to learn about later. That has to do with debugging. Hold on one second. <coughs> Trap flag we're going to learn about later. Interrupt flag we're going to learn about later. And interrupts. IOPL we're going to learn about in uh, in input output. That's just privilege level saying who is allowed to do inter input output. Not going to learn about that. Not going to learn about that. No, 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 no. I don't think we're going to learn about any of the rest. But IOPL, interrupt flag, and trap flag we're going to learn about later. And ID flag, as she asked, is bit 21 in uh, E flags. So really what we're trying to do right now is dump this to the stack, do some bit masking to set, you know, whatever. And so that's the, what I'm going to skip the actual code for this because it adds, you know, unnecessary complexity, right? But we obviously it says to set or clear the flag. So we need to go to the flag, check whether it's zero or check whether it's one, set it to the opposite, write it back, read it again, see if it got set to the opposite or not. And then if so, yes, you may use CPU ID. It's always going to succeed here, but you can go look at the code later. But it's really just, you know, running through the combinations of if it's zero now, do this. If it's one now, do that. <clears throat> All right. So, yeah. All right, so back to CPU ID. Assuming we can set or clear the ID flag, we can use CPU ID. So what can we get out of that? All right, so in the simplest case, uh, if you give EAX as zero, you set EAX to zero immediately before you issue CPU ID, what you're going to get back out is first, EAX will now be a thing telling you the maximum input value for CPU ID information. That says for what will look in the manual like this column, initial EAX value, you'll come back with a value that says, hey, the maximum thing you may ask for on this CPU is 
you know, hex 12 or something like that, right? So then you look at the table and you say, okay, I can use all that stuff, but I can't use hex 13 and, you know, because it's not anything that's on my CPU. And then also they have uh, a little string in there, genuine Intel, which you can put together and then you can print out, you know, hey, this is an Intel thing. And actually, again, this is something maybe I should put in, maybe I'll just always go to Wikipedia on it. But <clears throat> so on other models, so you can tell, for instance, what brand of processor you're running, because the other models will have these instead of genuine Intel. Right? So AMD is better, authentic AMD, transmeta CPU, rise, rise, rise. The smaller. Sorry, <laughs> That's right. I like that. These are good. The other vendors are very exuberant. Yes. Yeah. Well, you know they're the upstarts, right? All right. So that's what you get back. Genuine Intel. We'll run the CPRD instruction in a lab here in a second. You'll see that you put it together. And yeah, I think I heard someone commenting uh, these things are out of order and stuff like that, right? So, well, maybe, no, no one did. And you, yeah, so it's, you have to put EBX, EDX, ECX for whatever reason. <clears throat> All right. And so there'll be some other stuff uh, in the CPRD. I think I'll show that in a second after we run the lab, but I'll show some of the other sort of information you can get out of it. All right, so this is our lab. Uh, basically, the core of it is that, you know, you run this code, check if you can use CPRD. If yes, then go ahead, run some assembly that says, You'll create a string to create, uh, use the pointer EDI to store, uh, sorry, use EDI to store the address of vendor string pointer. And then we're going to put zero in EAX, call CPU ID, and then we're going to take, you know, the EBX, ECX, EDX, and use those to put those chunks in the right order to print it out. Yes? So, there's a, a, a little bit of a detail here. Given that I, I hear all these things about the, you know, protect virtualization code, relying on the timing and so forth. Are, do, do most virtuals, the virtualization systems actually duplicate some particular genuine processor CPU ID information? In some cases, they'll just pass it right through. Interesting thing I noticed with my Fusion, uh, VMware Fusion on my Mac, it reports my VM, my Windows VM, as an uh, Core i7 or whatever, which is what my actual physical that's right, and on my Windows machines, it reports, reports Core 2 Duo. Some may pass it directly through. In terms of the options that are available, for instance, the virtualization system may want to say, no, there's no such thing as hardware virtualization here. Don't be running any code which tries to, you know, turn that on, right? So um, it is going to be the case that some virtualization systems, you can think of it, hook calls to this instruction. Uh, I think it's actually just built into the for instance, x86 hardware virtualization, but I don't know yet because I haven't been research that for the advanced class. But I've heard references and talks and stuff saying that, you know, they can hook, the hardware support for virtualization will allow the hypervisor to hook any call to CPU ID that happens inside the guest, and it can return whatever it wants at that point, right? So it can say this or that feature doesn't exist. Heck, I've even seen in, like, some of the VMware preferences, I don't remember what version, it'll say things like, yeah, export the NX bit or something like that. So we'll learn about NX later, but it's it's just the bit that's used for doing uh, uh, non-executable memory. And so the hypervisor will actually tell the guest VM, sorry, there's no such thing as this non-executable memory support. So um, yeah, they can, they can hook that in some virtualization systems. Okay, so it went back to the point of detecting virtualization systems. There is some code. I tried to use it here, but it didn't seem to work because it it always said that I was virtualized even when I was on physical. We can try it on these machines. Maybe we'll get a different result. But um, it just executes like a bunch of CPU ID instructions, for instance, and tries to see, is this CPU ID instruction going a bit slow, right? Is someone maybe intercepting it and returning whatever they want? So there's that. All right, so we're going to do the lab quick um, just to have you walk through on your own and stuff a little bit. Um, the first thing, do you all have the intermediate x86 folder on your desktop?
Okay, hold on. There was a question before on the um, on the chat where Dave was asking, you know, whether a compiler would notice that the value returned from sub. So back in our, our example code where we had the, uh, yeah, sorry Dave, since you don't have the mic, um, in the future tell Bill if, uh, yeah, as he's doing now, but just tell Bill, you know, please interrupt Zeno. Um, <clears throat> his question was, you know, in that previous stack example frame we saw, where like, you know, we moved hex beef into EAX, and then immediately after we returned, we just moved hex food. He said, you know, would the compiler notice that that's pointless and cut it out? Yes, absolutely. Uh, we always run unoptimized um, code examples in our things so that we have simple assembly which maps very one-to-one. -one. If we run the optimized version of that example, it literally generates the, the, um, the instruction sequence move hex food to EAX return or something like that. And I don't think it even makes a stack trade. So. Question as well? Sorry, I'm going back to CPU ID, so that's uh, Yeah, no. Um, so is uh, a lot of those features I've noticed you can turn on and off from the BIOS. Yep. Is what CPU ID returns what's currently activated or what's possible, or am I deeply misunderstanding how this works? That's a good point. Um, I don't know that. See, that's I was kind of thinking when uh, uh, I can't remember. You, you don't like to go by Willy, right? William, what is your preferred? Uh, Willie, Willie's fine. Yeah. Okay. I couldn't remember. Yeah. So when Willie was asking before about the, um, you know, where is the CPU ID in information stored in? Um, Right? Is it stored in microcode or whatever? And you're saying, you know, there's this issue of turning on and off features in the BIOS and stuff like that. Uh, again, I don't know enough yet in order to say concretely, but I was kind of thinking in that case that it seemed more to me like there'd be some stuff hard coded in the CPU, but other stuff is just going to be stored in some, you know, non-volatile stuff once you start on, for instance, maybe the NVRAM. But that's on my list of stuff to figure out. All right. So, all right. Does everyone have uh, for people in the class or uh, for people catching up? That's fine. This won't be you know, groundbreaking lab. So just get your remote people get some lab environments set up, RDP or whatever. People in the class, do you have the intermediate x86 on your desktop? All right. Open that up. Go to intermediate x86 code, and then open the intermediate x86.sln. That's the solution file. Visual Studio will open that. It'll have multiple projects within it. I don't know how your stuff is going to look compared to mine. Hold on a second. All right. So when you're in Visual Studio, you've got up uh, your solution explorer somewhere. I like it over here. You expand CPUID, expand source files, open up CPUID.c. And so this has all the set ID flag and all that stuff is, uh, as we would expect, that's the complex stuff about um, checking whether you can set or clear the things. So the main thing is we're just going to uh, go down to the very end of the code, set a breakpoint on the turn hex baseball. As a reminder, you set breakpoints by going over to the sidebar and clicking, and a little red bubble should appear, and that's setting a software breakpoint on that location in the code. Before we compile it, we have to set CPU ID as the startup project. So right click on CPU ID actual project file and then uh, set a startup project. And then when you do that, it should appear as bold after that. All right, good, good. Yeah. All right. So set startup project and then just go ahead and, uh, you know, you've got your breakpoint, so go to debug and start debugging. All right, stop set hex, return hex baseball. And if you pull up the uh, little command window and stuff, it's going to say max basic CPU ID, so that was the value returned in EAX, is hex D. So if we go to the manual, we know that on this system, we can look it through the table, and hex D is the maximum one we can actually issue on here and have it, you know, talk back to us. And then finally, we took that string and we rearranged the parts and we printed it out 
And so this says, yes, I am on a genuine Intel CPU. All right, so that's really all there is to this. <laughs> Not particularly groundbreaking, but the point is, you know, now you know how you can issue the CPU ID instruction. You just need to you know, most of the time you don't even need to check. You're not, if you're not expecting to run on early 486s, just go ahead and set, you know, zero, set EAX to zero and then issue CPU ID. But then you need to know how to interpret the results. And the only way to do that is by looking at the Intel man. Right? So also in your intermediate x86 class, you've got a Intel manuals 2008 and Intel manuals 2009. Between 2008 and 2009, they changed some of the information about uh, virtual memory paging and stuff like that, which we'll learn about in the section, second part. I like the original version because it has nice pictures and stuff that I use in this class more than the new version. The new version has what looks more like tables. So uh, I prefer the Intel 2008 manuals. That's what all of your stuff in the slides is from the 2008 manuals, FYI. But uh, right now we're looking for how do you interpret CPU ID results? How do you, how do you know what everything you can find out? So in this uh, volume 2A, uh, ASM A through M, go ahead and double click on that. And then you can uh, expand the instruction set reference and expand the A through M. And then just go find the CPU ID. And when you do this, this, uh, this manual page is going to show you that table that I only showed you a part of before. And so now you can look down through the entirety of it. And you can see that, OK, let's go to hex D and see if there's even anything after that. Yep, so hex D is actually the last of the, quote, basic CPU ID information you can get. And when you get past the basic information, there's actually this extended information as well. So if you were to give, if you were to issue 800000, then you would get, you know, now the new pointer which says, you know, EAX will come back with your maximum value that's possible. Right? So you have to issue zero. If, if the only stuff you care about is in this initial part, zero through D, then, you know, you only need that. But if the stuff you care about, like, for instance, whether or not syscall, sysred are available, uh, then you need to like call some of this extended stuff. And yes, we don't know what this is calling this right are. This one actually, this is the one I like. Uh, processor brand string information. Very useful. Uh, and what it boils down to is in your uh, Windows system information, for instance, this string right here, starting with Intel Core 2, blah, blah, blah ending in 3 gigahertz, all of that string is taken from the CPU ID information. So you can take an issue a CPU ID on a computer and you can find out, you know, it's an Intel Core 2 quad CPU. The model number is like Q9650 and it's running at 3 gigahertz, right? So uh, that's definitely useful when you're trying to understand, you know, what sort of machines are out there. I use that in my own work for identifying, you know, is this machine the same as this machine? And therefore, should I accept the same behavior from it? <clears throat> and let's see what else. Here's another thing which is interesting. <clears throat> uh, virt virtual and physical address sizes. Sorry, hold on. You're back. <clears throat> Virtual and physical address sizes is basically telling you, can the system only access 32 bits of memory? Can it access 36 bits of memory? Can it access 48 bits of memory? And so the virtual and physical has to do with, you know, if you're actually in 64-bit mode, 64-bit mode doesn't actually, on current CPUs, doesn't actually have the ability to address two to the 64-bit bytes of memory. Uh, in reality, Intel constrains it for now. So it's something like 2 to the 48. I don't know. I was just skimming it. But the um, point is, you can't even buy enough RAM right now to have 2 to the 48 uh, worth of memory. Sorry, Zeno. 
Yep, go ahead. Quick question. Yep. Um, somebody was asking, what is the password for the VM? I didn't mark that down. Oh, yeah. Sorry. That is, well, we're not on the VM yet, so I'll tell you when we get there. No. Um, it is awesome password for the win, and it is spelled as is currently on the board. <clears throat> Capital A on awesome, space, password, space, capital F, capital T, capital W, exclamation point. Awesome password for the win. All right. So, yeah, anyways, back to that uh, physical and virtual stuff. Uh, yes, good point. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> it basically is telling you right now how many, how large of memory space you can actually address on your computer. Uh, whether or not your OS actually allows you to access all of that, that's a different question. And actually what we found in the last class, which I should credit um, Roman D for, since I can't pronounce his last name, um, is we found that actually if you go to the uh, Microsoft site, it turns out even though we talk later on about the capability, uh, even in 32-bit mode to access up to 2 to 36 bits of memory, uh, it turns out XP doesn't support that, but some of their other things like Windows Server 2008 and things like that will support that and beyond. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, so this ends up being something where if you want to know how much actual physical memory the OS, you know, has available to it, that will tell you this is how much RAM is actually installed in chips right now on my, uh, on my motherboard. And then let's see if there's anything else miscellaneous. There's, there's a lot of little like, you know, is this instruction enabled? Can I use, uh, you know, generally speaking, can I use uh, <coughs> virtual machine extensions, stuff like that? Is read is the um, TXT stuff in CPU ID? Yeah, it comes out in uh, ECX. Do you remember for what uh, input? My EAX is set to zero. It may not be that can't possibly be <laughs> correct. Well, it may not be in the 2008 manual. But if EAX is set to zero, no, that's the genuine the Intel. I don't All think right, it'd be there. Obviously not on zero. Is what? Is the external thing allowing this option? Yeah, I mean, I would expect it to be somewhere in the extended stuff. Yeah. So maybe it's so 8 zero. Actually, ask for their safe remote extensions. Oh yeah, that, that may not actually be in this manual. You're right, but that may okay. Be in later manual. Good point. All right, whatever then. Anyways. Point is, as new features get added, when Intel's coming out and saying, hey, we've got AES in our chips now, and hey, we've got virtualization, you need to go find the latest Intel manual, pull up CPU ID, and that's how you'll find out whether or not your processor actually supports it. There we go. That is CPU ID warm up for the day. <coughs> Anyone have any other questions on CPU ID? Uh, he said EAX for one, yeah. and it's in the 2009 manual. All right. Well, so Reed says that TXT, uh, Intel's uh, trusted extension technology, what is it? Trusted execution. Trusted execution. Trusted execution technology. And what you actually, there's, it's like a several step process to find out if TXT exists. You have to first ask for safe remote extension to this, and you can turn on the flag that allows you to ask if TXT is an instruction. Right. All right. So, uh, final thing I would just say is that uh, there's a good uh, piece of code for Mac users. Um, if you use the code here, he has a nice printout where he went through, enumerated, went and pulled in all the options, printed out nice little things telling you, you know, here's your processor, here's, it, do, it does or doesn't support this or that instruction. So the point is, you, uh, there's probably other, you know, Windows things, but I never looked it up. But if you go search for, like, something, it'll show you CPU ID information. I'm sure there's something that already enumerates over all possible options and tells you all instructions and everything else. And also, if you really want to dig into it and write your own sort of thing, if you want to, like, get into this, there's actually a full extra 
little application note PDF that uh, Intel has, which tells even more about CPUID than the uh, manual does. So now into um, into CPU I, CPU modes. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to search. So we're going to talk about you know where rings come from. When you hear ring zero, ring three, or kernel code, user space code, uh, we're going to kind of shimmy our way towards figuring out where that all comes from. All right. So the first thing you need to know is that in the beginning there was real mode and it was suck. So real mode is when you uh, restart your processor, it enters a CPU state called real mode. And uh, basically, even you know now that we have you know more advanced machines, it starts up and it's essentially think of it like a compatibility mode for their very first processors because Intel is all about the backwards compatibility, and so they're always trying to uh, make sure that you can keep using the old stuff when you've got the new stuff. So for instance, DOS ran in real mode. And uh, it's a very simple thing. It doesn't have uh, virtual memory. It doesn't have privilege rings. And it's 16-bit. So when you reboot, you're in 16-bit mode. And if you're running, you know, some, well, I won't say that yet. So anyways, real mode is a very simple thing, 16-bit. And it doesn't have a lot of the features we're going to talk about in this class. So what most OSs actually run in is protected mode. And uh, this adds capability to do uh, multitasking, protected, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the things we care about for this class that it adds is the ability to do uh, virtual memory, so paging and uh, making it so that you can only have you know 256 megabytes of RAM actually installed, but it will allow you to access a four gigabyte virtual address space, right? And if you didn't have virtual memory, that would mean you could only ever access addresses within that first 256 megabytes, right? And so that's what it means to have virtual memory. It's saying I can access memory anywhere. But secretly behind the scenes, those virtual memory addresses get mapped to whatever physical addresses happen to be available. And that's going back to that CPUID when I said it's telling you your physical address space. If you only have 256 megs of RAM installed, it's going to tell you in that. It's going to say, look, you can only access two to the however many bits equals 256 megabytes. So one thing I'm pointing out here is just that in protected mode, there is a thing called virtual 8086 mode, but it's not, Intel doesn't actually really consider that a full processor mode. It's more like a backwards compatibility thing. So you're in protected mode and you've got the benefits of virtual memory and stuff like that. But let's say you want to like run some old DOS programs in Windows 95 or you know, Windows XP, something like that. What the OS or what the processor is doing is being put into virtual 8086 mode so that as far as those old DOS 16-bit programs are concerned, you're in 16-bit having all the memory that looks like old style real mode. But in reality, you're still in 32-bit. It's just you've temporarily dropped down. But you don't want to drop all the way from real to protected, real to protected, because then you'll like be losing a bunch of uh, the stuff when you try to go back to protected. You'll have to recreate it all. So it's just a way to kind of drop down a little bit to trick old programs for backwards compatibility. Yes? Do you have any idea if that's if that's sort of what Windows does when you ask it to run a program in compatibility yeah. mode for DOS. I'm, I'm fairly certain that is because there was that uh, Tavis Ormandy, uh, I think it was, I can't remember whether you called it a virtual 86 mode exploit or whether you just called it DOS compatibility mode exploit. But it definitely was using, it was exploiting the fact that there was some disparity between the expectations in terms of how the OS is looking at things versus how, uh, how this old virtual 8086 was working. I'd wanted to add that in, but I've never gotten around to really like understanding the full details. So unfortunately, I can't put it in. And it would also make we already have too much material, and we can't get into virtual 8086 mode. So I just wanted to mention uh, virtual 8086 mode or V8086 mode to say that it's there. It's sort of like a backwards compatibility thing, trick applications. It is what's used for things like compatibility mode in Windows. But it's not really technically considered a full mode, at least as far as the manual is. All right. So that's the main thing. Most OSs run in protected mode. But I said that when you reboot the computer, it starts in real mode. Therefore, that means there is some initial bootstrapping code which gets you out of real mode into a protected mode. <coughs> System management mode, on the other hand, uh, is something which became, you know, was kind of Neglected for a while and no one paid attention to it, but it became popular uh, starting in 2006 when 
Louis, I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name right, but Louis Duflo uh, wrote a paper on how you could bypass some of the OpenBSD kernel protections using system management mode. So OpenBSD, even if you're in the kernel, it's still trying to protect itself within that. But the issue is with system management mode, it turns out, so we said the kernel OSs are running in protected mode. System management mode is actually more, you can think of it as more privileged than protected mode in that when you drop down to system management mode, it's sort of like real mode in that, you know, it doesn't necessarily have paging unless, I think what I've been getting from presentations that have been coming out is that you can still set up your own basic paging to use it, but so it can kind of access virtual memory, at least to the extent that it can access all physical memory. But the point is with SMM, um, it can access all of memory and there's hardware support for locking down SMM so that OS and hypervisors and stuff like that can't access it memory. So you set some code into SMM, you let it run, and then like the BIOS will set and say, lock this code down. No one may ever again, you know, read or write this memory. The only thing that can happen is when you get one of these SMM interrupts, the SMIs, or system management interrupt. When you get an SMI, it vectors into the code, it starts executing whatever you've already put there, and when it's done, it just returns back out to the rest of the OS. So whatever code is already there when it gets locked down can execute as much as we want and access all of memory, but the OS can't, you know, read or write to that code. So think of it like in the OpenBSD point, in the OpenBSD paper, the issue is he got into SMM, and because he was in SMM, he could read and write all physical memory. And if he can read and write all physical memory, he can just, you know, go find the OpenBSD kernel protection stuff, you know, find that memory, flip bits, you know, turn it off, make it so that it's functionally negated. And the same issue is, will recur with things like virtualization, right? So although you can use hardware-based virtualization to make it so that, you know, my guest OS can't screw with my hypervisor, if the guest OS can break out to it, you know, if the guest OS can get to system management mode, it's now running code which can read and write all physical memory, and that means it can read and write the hypervisor. So there's been exploits where you know, you're not supposed to be able to get into SMM once the BIOS locks it down, uh, but there's been exploits which have been found, which exploit like caching <clears throat> and other just uh, chipset specific problems uh, in order to have the attacker get into SMM, at which point they're more privileged than anything else running on the box. Yes. So there's also the secure mode. I mean, I know that a lot of that has to do with nothing else can execute at the same time, but is it also privileged in a way that well, well, first of all, I would say that as I currently understand it, first of all, SMM, I can't remember if this is an implementation one or the other. The thing I can say is that at like Black Hat Federal two or three years ago, there was an exploit where Invisible Things Lab was holding on to a private SMM exploit that they had, and they used that to bypass TXT or to break TXT or whatever. And so, in that context, it was certainly the case that SMM was more privileged than this, you know, lockdown as, uh, TXT mode. I can't remember though whether that was an issue. There's this issue here of, for instance, in the virtualization case, it is in the spec that there's a way to like essentially virtualize the SMM handlers so that it is no longer more privileged than the rest of the system and so that it can't just write all of stuff. But the issue is the virtualization vendors weren't making that. In the case of, or they weren't implementing that, like, let's lock down SMM. Because, you know, it's obscure and most people weren't attacking it. Most people didn't know anything about it. In the case of TXT, I can't remember the details of the attack to know whether it was an implementation thing or whether it was a fundamental thing that TXT wasn't thinking about sanitizing the SMM stuff or locking down the SMM stuff. I feel like whereas virtualization was an implementation thing, people just weren't implementing the thing. I feel like in the TXT case it was more serious and that it was the case that they didn't have specified at the time a way to lock down, but I'll have to double check that. I'll, I'll go look up that and talk quick at the break. Right, so there's kind of two ways to get into system management mode. One, modify the BIOS, because the BIOS is the one who actually loads up the system management code and says lock it down. Or two, have some exploit type thing, which allows you to read or write. So there's been like two or three, I can't remember whether it's two or three sort of 
actual exploit type things. One was caching, one one was the chipset one, and stuff like that. I think I have links. I don't remember, but they're definitely like my proposal for research like two years ago. Um, yeah, so, so the main point is I wanted to mention SMM because it's becoming more popular due to the uh, fact that it's priv more privileged than other stuff. It's definitely a target where you want to get there and then you can do whatever you want. You can break up. I mean, if you get into SMM, you have functionally a hypervisor escape vulnerability, right? All right. Yeah, but that's going to mostly go in the uh, advanced class because hopefully we're going to be learning a bunch of stuff about this and TXT and stuff like that, right? The point was let's learn some stuff about this so that we can uh, present the stuff more widely in the future. This, I like this picture because it reminds me of like a tripod from the Invasion of the Tripods or if you remember Batteries Not Included movie from the 80s with the floaty little aliens that are just big heads like this. It looks like that too. So this is great. This is uh, from the AMD manual actually. I had one person who gave a talk at Shmukon a couple years ago. I think it was a year before this last one. Uh, he had this in here. I never look at the AMD things. I don't believe an equivalent to this exists in the Intel documentation, but it's a great picture because it says, when you get a reset, all roads lead to real mode. Right? So this is the state machine. Oh, and hey, Jessica, this is a great uh, state machine example you could use for your FPGA class as well. When you get a reset, all roads lead to real mode. You restart the pro processor, you're in real mode. If you want to get from real mode to protected mode, there's this CR0, it's control register 0. There's a PE flag for protected mode enabled. You set protected mode enabled to 1, and bam, you've now moved into protected mode, and you can use whatever capabilities exist there. And then there was this eflags.vm thing. We didn't talk about it, but we said that's the virtual flag, or whatever it was, virtual mode flag. And so that is what kicks you over to that virtual AD86 mode, right, for backwards compatibility. Also, from protected mode, you can enable this, you know, LME, CR4, blah, blah, blah. You set some, set some bits, and you get into long mode, which is 64-bit mode. So this protected mode is 32-bit, and long mode is 64-bit mode. But there's also a compatibility mode here. So virtual AD86 is sort of like compatibility with real mode, and this compatibility mode is sort of compatibility with 32-bit. But overall, this is supposed to be a 64-bit execution environment. This is 32, that's 16, that's 16. But we've got this little system management mode off here to the side, collected and ignored until it uh, became popular. If you get if you get one of these uh, SMIs, system management interrupts, those bam vector you from wherever, anywhere you get an SMI, you're overrunning in system management mode, and the only way to get in and out is system management interrupt or resume whatever that is. RSM instruction is how they return out of system management mode to whoever had, was running at the time that the interrupt occurred. So that's a nice little state machine. All right, any questions on the modes quick uh, on the phone or anything? All right, so I said we're going towards uh, understanding where page rings come from and you know, what it means to be in ring zero versus ring three. So for uh, historic sake, uh, Multics was the first OS that actually supported hardware enforced privilege rings. So the key point here is x86 rings are also enforced by hardware. So when we talk about, you know, why can't user space, you know, just read kernel memory and stuff like that, it's enforced by hardware and we have to see, you know, where those bits are set around in memory that says, like, my code executing right now is ring zero. My code executing right now is ring three. We've got to find where that is actually stored. All right, and yeah, you probably heard it, but th there are four privilege rings on x86. The lower the number, the more privilege. So zero is more privilege than one, is more privilege than two, is more privilege than three. Typically, uh, they only use ring zero and ring three. Most OSs never ended up taking advantage of the other rings, and therefore, the 64 a bit thing, I believe the other rings actually just got dropped out. So there's still a ring zero and a ring three, but they only need one bit now to say zero or one. So there's user space is ring three, and kernel space is ring zero. All right, so the key point here is those rings have a lot to do with segmentation, so that's why we're covering segmentation first. But again, here's just a quick picture showing that, you know, here's conceptually what it looks like applications out here at ring three. Turns out no one ever ended up using one or two. I mean, some high security things did, but uh, no one that had mass market it was, is using them right now. 64-bit, I'm pretty sure they went away. 
But here is one example of how one could potentially leverage those extra rings. So Zen in pair virtualization mode, so pair virtualization is something that was made popular by Zen, and it refers to when instead of trying to just transparently use the OS as is, for performance and security reasons, you potentially want to make it so that the OS is hypervisor aware. So that instead of the OS going to reach out and try to touch the hardware directly, as it's used to all the time, instead it gets an API to access the hypervisor, and only the hypervisor is allowed to access the hardware because it's managing the hardware for many different OSs that it's virtualizing. So you don't want them stomping all over each other. Like if every OS can be directly control, you know, the one control register zero, they're going to be stomping all over each other. So Zen should be the only thing in pair virtualized mode that can access the hardware. The guest OSs are modified so that they're Zen aware. And then uh, the guest OS is deprivileged so that it runs in ring two rather than ring zero. And so if it tries to execute some ring zero instruction that can only be executed from ring zero, it'll cause you know a, a trap or a fault or interrupt or whatever. And uh, the hardware is going to kick it up to ring zero, which is Zen and Zen will handle it. I don't believe, well, other than the fact that if you had some code running in level one and if you had some code running in level two, two would be more privileged. But in terms of between them versus zero or three, well, functionally I would say how it works is there are some places in the system where only ring zero can do something. There are other places in the system where zero, one, or two can do something. So zero, one, and two are still considered supervisor level thing when we get to virtual memory. Uh, and so three is definitely always, you know, the least privileged. But in terms of supervisor, for instance, which is the only place I've ever seen something that's not, you know, strictly ring zero, uh, for supervisor mode, one, two, and zero, one, and two can all do the same thing. So there's no difference there. So it really wouldn't matter whether they're one or two in this sense. The only place I could think of where it might matter is when we get to that I.O. privilege level field in the E flags. That can say like only ring 0, 1, or 2, or 3 can access input output. And so in that case, you could say, look, only ring 2 or 1 can access I.O. and therefore 2 can't. So you could break up some granularity, but for all intents and purposes, uh, 0, 1, and 2 are most of the time just all privileged. It's just that normal. All right, so we have to understand segmentation. So here's a nice uh, complex diagram, which uh, the reality of the situation is not as complex as this, but this is sort of a conceptual thing. So um, I'll do it on here because it makes it easier on build. So the concept of segmentation. Me, sorry. Yes. Uh, is it possible to request a break real quick? Oh, yeah, you're right. It is time for a break. Thank you. 10 minute break. <laughs> back in, uh, back at 40 after.